Okay, I want to begin by recapping some of the themes from the last two days, and then we're going to uh, talk for the rest of the day about the issue of valuing as it arises in uh, Ayn Rand's mature writings. And by mature, I mean Atlas Shrugged and later. And I identify these as mature because I think all the elements of objectivism were in place by Atlas Shrugged, and there were elaborations and things after that, but not all the elements of it were in place in the Fountainhead, and so that's uh, why I draw that line there. I'm not, however, going to uh, talk in any great detail about the role that the idea of valuing plays in the novel Atlas Shrugged, including in its plot and theme and so forth, for uh, a number of reasons. Um, all of them uh, pragmatic rather than matters of principle, such as I spoke about that a lot last year in the course on Atlas Shrugged, and I'm writing another paper on it, and there's only so much time, and uh, I want to uh, focus on some other issues. But you can feel free to ask me about that. Uh, in the question period, I will draw some examples from Atlas, but I won't uh, say as much about the novel uh, as a novel in this connection as I have about We the Living or, uh, or The Fountainhead. Okay, so what are some of the themes that we've seen, uh, seen so far? Well, the first one that's been with us from the beginning all the way from the Little Street Notes is that there are valuers and non-valuers. There's a difference for the, between these people. For some people, life and things in life are meaningful and they have a passion for them and go after them, and for others, not. The valuers are idealistic or moralistic and efficacious. The non-valuers are zeros, part of the mass or mob, and so forth. Uh, early on, and even in the Fountainhead, and even in Atlas Shrugged, we get the idea of valuing associated with intense emotions and passions, things that uh, do come over you. So uh, even, for example, in the quote in The Fountainhead, where Rourke set, describes valuing as the single basic function of your soul, he speaks of finding yourself responding to things. You know, Wynand doesn't go around and go through some thing that Wynand in the moment recognizes as an act every time he sees one of Rourke's buildings, you know. Yes, I like this. And he compares it to some standard and says, yes, I like this. He's struck by the buildings. Uh, he has an intense response to them immediately. And likewise, every one of Ayn Rand's heroes falls in love at first sight. Um, there's, uh, you know, an immediate intent, or not some, you know, well, let me list her positive qualities and negative qualities and compare them to my standard for what the idea, you know, it's something that comes over one. Nevertheless, uh, so especially in We the Living, uh, where one sees the least about the internal workings of this process, uh, you might not get the idea that it is a process, it is something one does, because it's experienced and discussed in the novel uh, in the examples we see of it primarily as something that one experiences or that comes over one. Kira wants things, but we can see already in We the Living with the talk of this is the thing in me which knows how to want, the analogy of the blood vessels of the spirit, that there is meant to be some kind of action or process here that is responsible for the fact that we have these feelings. And uh, we see more and more of what this is in the Fountainhead. In particular, we see the progressive, you know, the in the notes leading up to the Fountainhead and the Fountainhead itself, the progressive tying of valuing to thought. In some of her notes uh, for the Fountainhead, including some of the ones on the handout, she moves back and forth between speaking of valuing and thinking as though they're the same thing. And in a way, I think there are. In the Fountainhead itself, and also in the notes, we see uh, uh, a very strong emphasis on standards and on figuring out how things relate to each other and understanding them as parts of valuing. Uh, so we get the idea that it's cognitive. And we have Rourke, especially towards the end of the novel in his speech and in his discussions with Wynand, talk about valuing as a function of consciousness, as something consciousness does, and as something one could suspend one's consciousness doing. Okay.
finally, we have the idea from the beginning that valuing is something one does as an individual, and there's a kind of individual assertiveness, an assertiveness of self in valuing, uh, that this in particular is involved in in the acceptance and following of any kind of abstract moral code, any kind of ideal. And from We the Living On, we have the idea that you can, from this fact about valuing as such, it imposes certain constraints on what codes of values are proper and which ones aren't. Ones that deny or undercut your ability to value have something wrong with them. They're not proper moral codes. In the Fountainhead, we have more of this, and the Fountainhead, part of its goal is to advocate egoism as the proper moral code, but uh, not in the way Atlas does, where it actually gives you a demonstration of egoism. So as we move to Atlas, and we'll talk a little bit uh, also about the moral basis of individualism, which was a nonfiction presentation of ethics that she tried to write uh, shortly after completing The Fountainhead and abandoned, and therefore you can see her in her notes for that, um, trying to put in nonfiction form and to lay out and prove uh, the, her ethical views as she understood them in The Fountainhead and progressively deepening towards the versions of these views that we find in Atlas. Um, Okay, so I want to talk about, oh sorry, there's one other theme I want to mention from, uh, that we've seen earlier, that I want to mention in the framing of the positive material for today, and this is something that I did not call attention to, but it's been seen earlier in the sense of in the works we looked at earlier. Valuing is what makes something, eff someone efficacious, it's what makes them, um, follow ideals, it, it's what makes them take large-scale actions, but not everybody is a valuer. And the obvious case of a non-valuer would be somebody who does not take any existential action. And so the example here is Renee Slaughter with her peanut. You know, yeah, she goes and she reaches for the peanut, but she does not exhibit any further effort. However, there are other people uh, Renee Slaughter is not a villain, and there are villains. And in We the Living, the villains don't do very much. They, all t they take only very small-scale localized actions, and their positions are made for them uh, by the misguided um, valuers, the people like uh, Andre. But in The Fountainhead, you have driven villains. In particular, you have a Tui whose whole life was directed towards a purpose, and you can read the description of him as a young man, that everything was subordinated for a purpose. And yet, Tui uh, is not a valuer. He's not, if you remember the descriptions Ayn Rand gives of the main characters, Rourke was the man who could be and was, Wynand could be but wasn't. Uh, Tui couldn't be and knew it. And the could be or couldn't be refers to this, uh, are they living in we the living sense of living? Are they a man in we the living sense of being a man, which means being a valuer, knowing how to want. So we have in the idea of Tui, and secondarily in the character of Keating, um, the idea in the Fountainhead, which isn't really present in we the living, uh, or not stressed, that there is not just a mere absence like you have in some of the characters of We the Living who are passive drudges, but there's an alternative way of being motivated that is vicious or bad, uh, and that comes out of this absence in a way, or is related to it. And in particular, it's being motivated through others in the Fountainhead, it's second-handedness. The second-hander acts, says Rourke, but the source of his action is not in himself, it's in somebody else. So this, there's a way uh, when you're motivated by others, uh, that you can, when you're relying on others valuing, that you can be active in the sense of busy doing a lot of things, and there being a certain directionality to one's action, even though one is not performing the processes that work and the heroes are performing inside, the processes which, in which valuing consists. 
Now we already see in the Fountainhead some discussion of the psychological mechanisms by which this is true. Uh, for example, in the boat scene between Wynand and Rourke, there's a discussion of the fact that um, people need self-esteem. And because they need self-esteem, uh, in certain situations they're going to uh, try to get it through others if they can't get it through themselves. And you see the beginnings of a means of explaining this. There's a lot more of this in the Fountainhead, uh, in Atlas Shrugged, um, uh, and a much more subtle view of the alternative motivation of, of bad people. Uh, I'm not going to talk that much about that. I will talk a little bit about it later, because my focus is going to be on the positive side. But I do want to point that out. And um, there's a good series of lectures by Daryl Wright on uh, called Motivation by Love versus Motivation by Fear, which addresses uh, this issue uh, more in a, I mean, with reference to the novels, but more in a, let's say, almost a self-help kind of context. Um, you know, how to identify the two types of motivation in yourself and so forth. But we'll get to those terms, motivation by love and motivation by fear, in a little bit. OK, so moving now from the fountainhead into the period afterwards, uh, into Atlas Shrugged and the moral basis of individualism, which uh, represents the transition between the two. What we have in Atlas for the first time is a complete moral theory and a validation of it. And that's in particular important, because we don't have any attempt to validate or prove egoism in the fountainhead. You just show an egoist versus an altruist, uh, a selfish man versus a selfless man. And s a lot of facts germane to proving it come out in the story, and attention is called to them. But there's no kind of systematic attempt to present it, as there is in Galt's speech. And you'll notice that the theme of Atlas Shrugged uh, includes as part of the theme demonstrating a new moral philosophy, which is not something included in the theme of any earlier novel. Okay, so we have a complete uh, moral theory and a validation of it. Uh, how does this work and what's new? Well, we see her first trying to present and validate a moral theory in the moral basis of individualism. And we see uh, a, a certain progression. She has from the beginning the idea that man's life is the standard of value, um, that we need to have a code of ethics which is going to be egoistic and based on our survival requirements. Uh, and on the requirements of living in particular, though, as the sort of creatures we are, of living a man's life. And the idea that the processes of independent judgment and creative work, which were uh, themes in the central ethical content of the Fountainhead, are going to be uh, central to this. Early on in her notes, or midway in her notes, uh, for the moral basis of individualism. We see uh, a moment that uh, Dave Harriman in his uh, editorial n notes uh, on the journals calls attention to, uh, and Leonard Peikoff in his introduction commented on, where she thinks about what the right order to present these ideas in. And she crosses out what she had written previously and says, you know, the way to go is to say why we need a code of values and build from there. And this, I think, is the important new idea in this work. Her views at first are that values are needed, a code of values are needed, because of two things, life and free will. Um, throughout, she has been analogizing the process of valuing to life and seeing it as a case of life. Life is something that's directed. It seeks an end. It's uh, integrated around a function or a purpose. Think of Rourke um, comparing his buildings to living things. There's one central idea. Uh, living things also act to sustain themselves. And as of the fountainhead, we have the idea that it's the function of the creator's soul, the moral soul, to create the things that we need to survive. Everything we have, from the wheel to the skyscraper, the highest religious abstraction, is a function of our reasoning mind. So our life depends on our reasoning, and in particular, our rational direction of our life, our valuing, our value seeking. Um, the idea that life is a standard, values are needed because of the requirements of life will die otherwise. Uh, 
and freedom. Why freedom? Because other living things act automatically. Therefore, they don't need values. Or anyway, they don't need a code of values. At the time, she would say they don't need values. And we'll see why that would be. Um, but since we have to consciously direct our lives, uh, we need to ha identify things as goals to seek, set them for ourselves as goals to seek, want them, and go after them. Otherwise, we won't survive. There won't be any structure to our lives. We'll just kind of waste away and die. OK, so these are the new uh, ideas that are coming up in the moral basis of individualism. She abandons this work. Um, there are some other ideas in this progression, which I'll say something about later. But um, in writing Atlas Shrugged, she goes a level deeper. And that's what I want to talk about right now. She gets the idea of what she called values for weeds, sort of informally to herself as she was writing this. Now, to see what this means, we have to step back a bit and trace her use of the word valuing. In the We the Living uh, and Little Street notes, right, to, a value was something profound and metaphysical. Uh, you'd have aesthetic values, moral values. You know, your socks would not be values. You know, it was something grand, metaphysical, life-changing, life-shaping. The drapes you had in your house wouldn't be values by those standards, even if they were really nice drapes and you liked them. Um, by the time of the Fountainhead, we get a little bit of a more extended sense of it. Because Dominique is non-valuing when she's not doing things like selecting drapes. And she's just not making any choices at all. So you have some sense that any consciously selected thing is a value, which means that there's something that's a piece about all conscious selection and direction. Um, there's the same process going on maybe with differences in degree or intensity in uh, picking out your clothing in the morning and deciding on your career, at least if you do them both excellently, if you do them both well in the way that Ayn Rand heroes do them. Um, but she doesn't see the same process, or it's essentially at the deepest level, notwithstanding important differences, the same process as taking place in plants. It's inherently a conscious process. And Leonard Peikoff pointed out in, um, I think it was in his Centenary Reminiscences on Ayn Rand, that at this earlier stage in her thinking, she defines a value as that which one seeks to gain or keep, with the word seeking denoting something conscious. And that later she changed it to the definition we know from Atlas and beyond, that which one acts to gain or keep. We have the idea that even plants uh, and animals have values in the sense of things that they select uh, in order to, things that, that they select which they need in order to live. Now, exactly when she gets this, she said she didn't get it until writing Galt's speech. And you don't find any full expressions of it in her journals until then. But you find various gropings and getting closer to it and so forth. Now, this uh, is an important idea for a number of reasons. It makes it not, it makes human life continuous in important ways with uh, lower forms of life that makes it easier to see the objectivity of values. And in particular, it lets us get rid of a kind of disconnect that previous philosophers couldn't get rid of between uh, living and living man's life. You might think, and Ayn Rand herself thinks in some of her notes, uh, that what the ultimate value is isn't life, staying alive versus being dead, but living in the way proper to man rather than as Peter Keating lives or something. And so, so kind of standards of propriety are built into the goal to begin with, are built into the goal of life. 
And if that's the case, that is, if the ultimate value is living a John Galt-like life rather than a Peter Keating-like life, um, there's some question as to how one validates that. What if somebody said the ultimate value is living a Mother Teresa-like life? Or the living a life that's mostly John Galt-like, but involves after you've made your fortune giving it away to charity? Or something like that, which won't you know, kill you if, as uh, everyone would be dead if we tried to live like Mother Teresa. Um, so this uh, perspective and I'll say how in a moment, enables us to get around that, to get past that, and to see how one could validate the content of the standard man's life, the content of be like John Galt, not like Peter Keating, uh, by seeing how this makes life itself possible, how this is the only way to survive. We see gropings towards that in the earlier notes, but it's now clear in Atlas. Incidentally, I talk a lot about this issue in uh, the first uh, the first Ocon course I gave, the course on Aristotle as ethicist, where I talk about the difference between Ayn Rand and Aristotle's ethics. Um, and this comes up there. So I refer you to that for a kind of full treatment of that issue. Okay, so prior to Atlas, we have the idea of values as things that are conscious and chosen. Uh, we now have broadened it in the case, by the time of Atlas Shrugged, to that which something acts to gain or keep. Now, two consequences of this broadening. Um, the one consequence, the, the, well, one major one that the others are derivative of. The, the, the central consequence of this broadening is that we can now tie the concept valuing to life as such. Because we could ask, you know, what does the two in act to gain or keep mean? Uh, when you seek to gain or keep something, what it is to seek something is something that's directly introspectable. It's to set your mind towards something and go after it. Uh, that's not the case of what it is to act to gain or keep something. Uh, in a sense of two, that includes a begonia because begonias don't do that. And so when you have the idea that there's a concept of value as something that one, be one a human being, a dog, or a, a, a plant, acts to gain or keep, uh, you see some fundamental similarity between the directedness of all these actions. And you're trying to identify what that similarity is between the directed quality of all these actions, that which gives rise to the direction of them. Now we've seen that she had this similarity in mind all along because the wanting, which was Kira's ability to direct her life, uh, was the life itself. It was like the blood vessels. Blood vessels being something that don't decide and choose. It's an, a, uh, a vegetative or nutritive process. That is, a, a, you know, blood vessels doing what they do is like a plant doing what it does. Right? Um, but now we have that focus and center stage. And we had the idea when we were talking about valuing as a conscious process, that it involves the projection of a purpose, right? And then um, that is in itself is an act of valuing and the selecting of other things in accordance with that purpose. So you, don't, you, you go for things, but the structure of your going for things involves integrating things uh, in response to some situation. Remember we talked about the architectural problem. You project some central idea as a solution to that problem, as a way to proceed in light of that problem. And then you, your action as a whole exhibits a kind of directed, integrated quality because you use that central idea as a standard in accordance with which you select all the actions and all the details of the actions and products. Well, if you go broader from that idea, you have the idea that a value presupposes a purpose, and more generally, a value presupposes some kind of a context in which it can arrive, like the architectural problem. Broaden that from consciously selected values to all values, and they have the idea that a value presupposes 
an actor, which we've had all along, something that does the valuing and goes after the thing that's valued. And now it presupposes an action in the f an actor acting in the face of an alternative. And what are the different alternatives? And um, the ultimate alternative is the alternative between existence and non-existence. And it's the things that have to act in the face of this alternative, namely living things, that exhibit this quality of acting towards things. What acting to do something is, uh, that, that feature of the world comes up and only could come up in the case of living things. Why? Because acting to requires there to be some alternative or goal, some end uh, that selects the means so that the means are in order for the end to come about. And that arises only in life because one, and these are two perspectives of looking at the same fact, only living things act in the face of some alternative and two, and this way I think is sometimes easier to think about it, only life is an end in itself, literally. That is, what is life? Life is a process of action aimed at that very same process of action. To borrow a term from the environmentalists, uh, life is a, it's more than, but this is a, Life is a sustainable process. Uh, life isn't a, it's, it's a self-sustaining process, right? But it's not just one particular process that is life, the process that a begonia goes through. But it's rather, it's something more abstract than that. Life is a process which is aimed at the continuance of the, that process and of the agent performing that process as a performer of that process. And any process that is like that is a life in whatever ways the lives may differ, whether it's you know, collecting sun rays and making food or the very different going around and tearing up things that do that to eat. OK, so we have the idea that life makes valuing possible and necessary, that values arise only in the context of life. Uh, valuing is what living things do and what their living consists in. It's directing themselves towards being things that continue on directing themselves towards these very things. Now you can literally say that somebody like uh, the villains in, we, well, any Ayn Rand villain, is in a very real sense not living. And it's not a metaphor that he's not living. I mean, suppose I were to chop off your head. There would still be a lot of metabolic processes going on in your cells. But what there wouldn't be is a whole thing, you as an organism, which is going about directing everything it does towards the maintenance of you as an organism. And that would be the case even if, because of something accidental to yourself, all your various blood cells were, you know, all the various cells in you were kept alive. You know, I put some thing instead of a head on you that made your heart keep pumping or whatever and stopped the blood from squirting out the top. And, okay, so somebody who's bad is in a real way not living even if he's going on, because he's not directing himself in this way. He might have parts or you know, subsystems in him which are being directed in some more localized sense. Now, in the human case, values are conscious and chosen. Values are purposive, because uh, we do not automatically engage in a process of sustaining ourselves. And this is why we need codes of values. We need ethics. Because in order to live, we have to uh, perform a self-sustaining, you know, a sustainable, if you like, but it's stronger than that process, 
by choice, find one for ourselves, and, uh, and go about performing it and direct ourselves towards performing it. So in the human case, values are uh, conscious and chosen. But because all our values are conscious and chosen, we don't automatically act for anything. And because our desires for things come from our values, there's one new element that I, we have to add uh, or reintroduce in Atlas Shrugged. And you can see her in the notes for the moral basis of individualism realizing this. So a lot of her earlier notes take the form, uh, and there are some phrases in the fountainhead that take the form, we all want to live. Okay, now how do we go about doing it? What's the right way to do that? How do we achieve the goal of living? Well, you've got to be individual, you've got to think for yourself, etc. Uh, in the, in the uh, moral basis of individualism note, she kind of gives as an axiom from which she thinks ethics should start, man uh, exists and his survival is desirable. So the idea is that a certain goal Survival is just preset and accepted as an axiom. It's just the case that man's living, you, your living, you know, is a goal, and you have to go for it. And what you have to do, what ethics and tells you how to do, is select and choose the subsidiary values that will lead to this ultimate value. What she realizes in writing these notes, or anyway, marks down in, in some revisions of these notes to herself, is that even the desire to survive is not automatic. And this follows from the fact that we don't uh, have any automatic knowledge or automatic direction. If the de desire to survive was automatic, um, we would have to what? We'd have to know automatically what survival was uh, so that we could be directed towards it. What would it be to be automatically pursuing survival? if you don't automatically know or find or seek out any of the things that are necessary for survival. And so the formulation that we get in Atlas Shrugged itself is not that ethics rests on an axiom of, this, of the sort, man exists and must survive as man, but rather that her morality rests on what? Does anyone know or remember? Choice. <coughs> well, it's two things, right? An axiom and a choice. So the axiom part brings in um, the facts. You know, you exist, the world exists, you have a certain nature, and the world has that nature, but also a choice. I want to live. So uh, value depends on, uh, sorry, uh, the ethical code derives from this axiom and a choice. If you choose to live, then the issue of valuing arises because it's only in the context of a living thing, something which is pursuing its own continued existence, pursuing its own pursuing. Uh, it's only in that case that the whole concept of valuing, the whole phenomenon of valuing arises. So life, the ultimate value, the thing which is an end in itself, is itself chosen as a value. Uh, once one chooses it, it sets a standard by which one can direct the course of one's life, by which one can find a kind of life that is self-sustaining. One can come up with a central idea for what one's life will be, say the central idea Howard Rourke architect, uh, which one which will then serve as the standard for selection of the particular things that Howard Rourke goes after in his life, and which itself, the central idea for a life, Howard Rourke architect, uh, Henry Reardon Steele maker, um, meteorologist, but, but you want to get the, whatever, however you would describe the central idea of Reardon's life. Um, this itself is in accordance with a standard uh, of what kinds of lives, what kind of life, it's a concrete under the abstraction, man's life, the kind of life that a human being 
uh, the kind of process of action that keeps a human being alive, that is a human life. The result of all of this is uh, brings us to the thesis that we started with, that values are objective. Now this idea, the phrase values are objective rather than intrinsic or subjective is not in Atlas Shrugged. It's a later in the article, What is Capitalism? statement of the nature of her position. But the position is already complete in there in Atlas Shrugged. She just finds different ways of describing it and comparing it to other positions that people have held. Uh, a value involves, a presupposes a valuer and a valuer acting in order to keep being around as a valuer. In the human case, uh, this is a conscious process. And so values or the good don't exist independent of men and their minds, but and in particular, independent of their setting something as a goal for themselves, which they're going to pursue. There is no value that is not, in fact, an object of someone's pursuit. There is no value without somebody who is valuing it, but not anything that somebody might set as an object of pursuit is a value. Um, for it to be the sort of thing that a value is, for it to have the kind of nature of values as something that's pursued for the sake of something, as something that can a life can be directed around and towards, it has to conform to certain standards, uh, the ones that um, are identified by ethics. So what ethics tells us is, as Galt puts it in saying what he, uh, what he taught the world, how life is to be loved. If you're going to value things at all, rather than to um, go about motivated in some other way, some way that is self-destructive and is essentially different from the way in which all living things act at the deepest level, if you as a human being who has to do this by choice are going to survive and what amounts to the same thing, to live, to proceed and go through one's life in this way, one must do it in a certain way. There's a way in which life is to be loved and pursued. And that's what Galt uh, teaches us. That's what ethics tells us. The alternative is motivation not by love but by fear, uh, which, again, I'm not going to to talk about the nature of that. But that is the nature of that alternative motivation. I'll be happy to take questions on it, but it'll be a distraction to do it in the course of the presentation. But this gives us a lot of questions. I mean, this idea of a choice to live or a choice to value or pursue things, accepting one's life as something to go after by choice, creates a lot of questions. It's, it, it's difficult to understand in some ways, or has been seen as difficult to understand. There have been challenges to objectivism posed on the basis of it, or just confusions people have had, because it is a kind of bold and radical idea. So I want to just list some questions that have come up in connection with this. And I want to spend the rest of today kind of chewing these and thinking about them and showing how the material from earlier than Atlas, seeing how this flew out of, grew out of the way she was thinking earlier than this, helps to illuminate what the answers to these questions are and to see it in the later writings too. Uh, isn't this choice to live arbitrary? If morality is based on a choice to live, well, why do you choose to live rather than to die or choose something else? Doesn't, isn't morality somehow arbitrary or capricious? It's, in the end, it's subjective rather than objective because it depends on a choice and there's no reason to make that choice as opposed to the other alternative choice. That's one question. Two, doesn't it lift the bad guys off the hook? Uh, if morality doesn't even arise until someone chooses to live, Suppose you have somebody who doesn't choose to live, Jim Taggart or some terrorist 
who, uh, who wants to die and so, you know, gets on a plane and tries to bring it down with him or a, um, you know, the suicide bombers. Um, can, can we say these guys are evil? I mean, clearly we think they are evil, but um, they're not trying to live. And the issues of moral standards only come up in the context of someone's trying to live. These people aren't, so they didn't apply to them. Therefore, we shouldn't be able to, it seems, evaluate their actions at all. People have raised this as an issue. Um, so what is the evil? You know, wh what's wrong with these people? Uh, can we criticize them even though they don't choose to live? Now you might say, and I've heard objectivists say this, well, yeah, but all values presuppose choosing to live. And the terrorists who get on, who, you know, walk in with their bomb vests to the store are, are taking actions. They're pursuing some goal. After all, they had to go and buy the dynamite, and they spent a lot of time lacing it up to the thing, and they uh, found a way to conceal it, and they picked a store to go to, and after all, they've got some cause that they're, you know, being terrorists for. So these people do have values. Uh, therefore, they do choose to live. And what's wrong with them is that they're acting contradictorily to their choice to live. Now, I think that's the wrong answer to this question. But um, it raises the, the, the possibility of that kind of an answer, raises another question. Well, who are the people who don't choose to live? Because if some guy who wraps himself up in dynamite and blows himself up is doing this as kind of an expression of a choice to live, it's kind of hard to think of who isn't then choosing to live. Uh, I mean, if that's not, not choosing to live, what, you know, what would be? And you think, well, some guy who doesn't take any action at all. So someone who doesn't choose to live would be somebody sitting in the corner, you know, kind of waiting to die. But, you know, I've never encountered, I mean, there's that guy in the corner back there, but uh, I mean, even he's, you, know, you don't find people lurking in the corners waiting to die. So. Um, what's going on here? Uh, if everybody chooses to live, it doesn't seem like it's really a choice. If it's really a choice, well, who and where do you find the people who, who are making the other choice? Okay. Um, a more specific question related to this. What does the choice look like in practice? How does the choice confront one? Has one? Have you made this choice to live? And when and in what form? And what does it look like? What is it to choose to live? Um, OK, so what can we say about these questions? I think let's just take, uh, I'd like to get your thoughts on this for a few minutes. And then I'll, I'll give my views on it in the back. Yeah. Well, if you're saying that everybody who's in a war is a person who's choosing not to live, and I'm not quite sure I can go there with you. The uh, Sorry, terrorist I... bomber on the 911 plane has to be compared to the kamikaze bomber in World War II, where they would take their planes onto the deck of a battleship to take it out of commission. Yeah. Well, all those people are fostering their ideals at a minimum, right? Uh, I don't think they are, actually. but. Um, but uh, but let me you know go with you for a minute. Okay. Well, I'm just going to say you know mm -hmm. uh, they are fostering their ideals, rightly or wrongly. I think their error is in, in choosing not to live, because people make choices that shorten their life or terminate their life more, sh mm -hmm. more uh, in a shorter term. Uh, right. Choosing to foster their family or do other things. Right. People make sacrifices, but they're not really sacrifices though. Because if you're doing it to foster your ideals, mm -hmm. that is a choice for life. Well, let's think about this. Uh, I agree that people do, and even ought to, or do legitimately, morally, and I wouldn't criticize them for it, make some choices sometimes that result, even consciously on their part, in their living less long than they might otherwise live. And that there are even some cases in which I think it is right and an expression of a valuing of life to choose something knowing it would lead to your immediate death. Um, for example, in Atlas Shrugged, Galt gives the example that he would kill himself if uh, he knew that um, the, the, the villains, if the villains had discovered his love for Dagny and therefore were using 
uh, torturing her, trying to get him to comply, he would remove her out of that danger by killing himself. And I think that is, Galt is, after all, the very emblem of loving life. Um, I think that is an example of loving life, not something that's contrary to it. So I agree that it's not the mere fact that these people um, uh, do something that they know will kill them um, that shows that they're not at some deeper level loving life. But nevertheless, I think that these people are not. And um, part of it is, and I have to think of what the reasons are, but part of the reasons why I think they're a, a, a clear example where the other cases I don't think even come up as, a, as, as plausible an example is that this isn't some weird situation for them. I mean, these people have a, you know, a, they go about doing this all the time. There are lots of people who walk into shops blowing themselves up. Uh, it's a whole subculture of blowing yourself up, you know. Um, it's, not, uh, it's not like somebody in some really strange situation, uh, his last ditch effort to save his value. Um, secondarily, and I think this is the kind of deeper point, the way you put it is whenever you have people acting for causes, they're not sacrificing because it's their cause. Now, if you accept that view, then there's no such thing as a sacrifice because anything anybody does, he does because he has some reason to do it. And um, he chooses to do it. You have a, a psychological egoism now where anything that anybody does, he does because he sees it as a means to uh, what he identifies as his life. Uh, and uh, that I just don't think uh, is true. But more, uh, um, the more immediate consequence of it, why I would think we can see that, is it gets rid of the distinction between a sacrifice and a non-sacrifice, between um, egoism and non-egoism altogether. Because the very fact that you are the chooser makes, um, makes the choice to your self-interest, makes whatever you're going after not a sacrifice and something that's good for you, an expression of a love for life. And so we start to lose the meaning of all of these distinctions. And so we want to go back and now, and I think this is the kind of thing that was happening in Ayn Rand's thinking. She was saying, yes, you know, any cause that you pursue, isn't it still your cause? Um, yeah, if you're pursuing it in the way that the best people pursue it. And yet there's a kind of people and a kind of action that seems essentially different from that. What is that difference? There's something deep in the motivation that's different. What and how? How is that working? Betsy? Well, I think it's a matter of what you consider life to be and whether it's a life uh, consonant with human nature or not. And, uh, for instance, James Taggart is looking for a life without effort. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, he doesn't want to be bothered with working toward goals, and he resents the people who do. What yeah. he's after is different than life as Dagny or Galt would What say. does James Taggart want? Uh, his goal is, as Cheryl puts it, you want to be a man like Hank Reardon without the necessity of being what Hank Reardon is, without the necessity of being anything at all, without, and then she feels a stab of horror, the necessity of being. James Taggart has something he's sort of after, but he doesn't want to be anything. He doesn't want to exist. Um, Whereas what? Hank, what does Hank Reardon do? Hank Reardon wants a medal, and he thinks of the steps necessary to make that medal, and he's focused on what he wants, how to get it, what he has to do and be to get that. So there is a real difference between the way Reardon and Taggart are motivated. Uh, and we have to understand in Rand, the idea of wanting to live, 
of valuing your life, of choosing to live, as mapping onto and explaining that difference. The thing that, that clarified an awful lot of, about Ayn Rand's definition of morality was when I realized that life has to be the standard. Uh -huh. That's what dictates moral behavior, mm -hmm. and it dictates the dictates the choices that you make. Because if it's if if your if your actions are not aimed toward life, mm -hmm. they're not moral. Okay. So the, these guys that commit suicide, mm -hmm. uh, they're not looking for life. They're mo they're they're looking for uh, something that does not involve being alive. They're looking for heaven. Uh -huh. or so whatever. because but it's the, the life is the standard <clears throat> that you have to. Right. So because life is the standard, they're not being moral, because life is the standard of morality. Um, yet morality, well, the argument for that, that life is the standard of morality, turns in part on the idea that valuing anything at all presupposes choosing and accepting life as a value and as your ultimate value. The, the argument, how does the argument presuppose that? Well, the argu well what is the argument? The argument is that uh, goes from the nature of what a value is. A value is something that one acts to gain or keep something. <laughs> to act, what is it to act to gain or keep something? Uh, and we get the idea that uh, it's to act in the face of an alternative, the alternative between life or death, to act to promote life. Uh, but this seems to spiral back around so that you can now say, well, if you have an incorrect value, an incorrect thing you're acting towards, something that's an immoral value, it becomes unclear how that's even possible until we get the kind of position that the gentleman back in the corner was taking. Uh, now, I want to only have one more kind of thing, and it, it'll be Christina, because she's been yeah, waiting. Right. <clears throat> no, I think I would answer that question. She said that they don't want them to live. They want mm -hmm. you to die. Right. In other words, if they were just killing themselves, you could have a case that they're outside morality <clears throat> No, but they're really there to kill other people, mm -hmm. not just kill themselves. So that's what makes people. Yeah, they've come to be out to kill other people. Uh, they're, the reason why we, and there are a few points packaged in here. Uh, one is that their motivation is essentially different. We, we're going to have to understand that motivation relative to the facts that make motivation work in a healthy case. Uh, that's a matter of psychology. How does it come to be that they're motivated in this different, strange way? But um, at least part of why we have to evaluate and classify them as evil is because whatever's going on in them makes them act in ways that are detrimental to us. And it's not just that they act at random, and that's detrimental to us. We can see, at least in the characterizations in Ayn Rand's novels, and I think we can see it in life, that there is some kind of dark forces in psychology or somewhere, we can think about what they are, that conspire to make these people choices in some kind of undead manner because it's not in the normal, living, vital manner in which one selects a direction, and yet there's some kind of selectivity aimed at destruction, and aimed at destruction of us. And that makes us need to recognize that these people are that way, that they're that way as a result in some way of their choices, and that's the facts that we're acknowledging in calling them evil. I think that's true and very important. I think the way, though, into answering this nexus of questions and getting some more purchase on it is to think a little bit more about uh, what form the choice to live actually takes, how one makes it, how it presents oneself to one, what are some examples of someone's actually choosing to live, and what is the alternative to that? 
there's a really powerful, I think, example in Atlas Shrug, uh, where we have somebody facing a real crisis. This is Reardon. Uh, the Equalization of Opportunity Act has just been passed. And Reardon uh, owns a number of businesses. He's uh, trying to produce Reardon metal in a world that's becoming, uh, where all the suppliers of things have been becoming increasingly unstable. Reardon is able to do what he does to be the most reliable, uh, the only reliable uh, provider of metals to be able to meet his orders, to do all the things that Reardon's life consists in because Reard Reardon has practiced vertical integration in his business. He's bought a, a, a mines and ore mines and coal mines and so forth, which is why he's able to get the materials he needs to produce, uh, to produce his metals when other people are relying on one another and there's nobody trustworthy to rely upon. And uh, now he's uh, in talks to buy a copper mine because he can't get any reliable source of copper. Copper is getting harder and harder to get, and he needs a lot of copper to make reared metal. And this is why he bought all the other things that he's bought. And now a law has been passed that says he can't do this. He can only have one business. He can't buy the copper mine. He's got to get rid of his ore and coal mines. Uh, he's got to get rid of something that was essential to his whole way of doing business, to his whole way of living. Uh, something that involved, because think of what these processes are. He has a goal, a value he's after, producing weird and metal. He figures out the best means to it and selects them and builds a life process of running this large industrial concern, vertically integrated industrial concern, and now he, that's being taken away from him. His life is being interfered with. He's being locked in airtight, and perhaps the blood vessels of his spirit will burst. And he thinks, what's the use? Thinking back on everything he's done in his life leading up to this moment, on the whole progression of how he came to, to have this business of, of when he was first in the ore mine. This is quote 48, by the way. Thinking back on his life and all the steps that led him to where he is now. What's the use? Why had he done it? Why should he ever want to do anything again? Now what we have I think it, quite explicitly here is somebody facing one, a motivational crisis, but what's the question he's asking? Why should I act? Why should I do anything? What's the alternative? He doesn't have to do anything. He could go and lie on the couch and eat peanuts. Right? Why should he ever, it's not why should I try to run an industrial concern in a world that's unappreciative, in a world that thwarts me. It's why should I ever want to do anything again? Why not just give up, is what he's contemplating, and not be alive anymore? Maybe not commit suicide, but do something like what Leo does in We the Living. Just kind of become, try to make oneself into a nothing. And so he thinks, his first day on the ledges of the ore mine, the day when he stood in the wind looking down at the ruins of a steel plant, the day when he stood here in this office at this window and thought that a bridge could be made to carry incredible loads on just a few bars of metal, if one combined a truss with an arch, if one built diagonal bracing with the top membered curved to, he stopped and stood still. He had not thought of combining a truss with an arch that day. In the next moment, he was at his desk, bending over it, with one knee on the seat of the chair, with no time to think of sitting down. He was drawing lines, curves, triangles, columns of calculations, indiscriminately on the blueprints, on the desk blotter, on somebody's letters. That is, he was in a frenzy of directed activity. He was doing something again. Why? What did he see? that made him want to do this. He's saying, why should I ever do anything? Well, why did I do the things that I've done up till now? And in doing that, he thinks, gets a new idea, some new thing that he sees as possible, that he sees as good. He sees what would come out of it, how it would relate to all the other things that he wants. And he is just filled with a passion to do it that wipes everything else out. I think that here we have a literal example of somebody who's considering dying, what amounts to dying. Considering just giving up, I don't think he's 
you know, it's the prevailing alternative in this consciousness, but he's, you know, why bother, is his question. And here's the answer. This bridge, that's why bother. This bridge, look how great it is. Look how fantastic this bridge is. Look at what's possible. And he just chooses it. He wants that bridge, and he goes ahead and does it. What we have here is someone who's looking out at the world, grasping the kinds of causal relationships between things in the world in a certain situation, which is presupposed as a context. What's the situation? There are people, they need transportation, one needs to get things from one place to another. That is a kind of set of things that makes in the background bridges as desirable and such things like this. Uh, but in this context, he sees something new and better, solving the problems that exist in the world better than they could have been solved before. And that is something that he has a, a love and a passion for, and he pursues it. And that's what gets him through this moment. Now, in a certain way, it turns out he was mistaken, because the way to get that bridge is to, in a certain sense, give up, to give up on those actions outside in the world, because pursuing them will result in the destruction of the bridges. But that's not the point here. The point is, what keeps somebody like Reardon going? Reardon is projecting possibilities, endorsing them. OK, but Reardon's doing of that depends on his already th having a lot of content of the form, you know, bridges are good. Uh, being able to get from one place to another is good, so a way to build a better bridge more cheaply and so forth is a good thing, and that's what makes his thoughts go along this line. So it pushes the question back one. Why does he think those things? That's one tack into this. Here's another level of attack into this. When do people choose to live? When does one choose it in those terms? What would it even be to choose to live? What would be involved in thinking of what one's doing as choosing to live, or even choosing a life for oneself? Think of an animal. Think of a, a tiger, maybe, that's roaming around across the plains. And think of what's going on in the tiger's mind, such as it has it. The tiger gets hungry. He sees a gazelle pass by. He remembers what a gazelle tasted like in the past. He's filled with a gazelle desire. <laughs> and he goes off after it and eats it. Later in that day, feeling good and satiated, he sees a tigress. It picks up her scent on the wind of the relevant sort. Again, filled with a desire, goes after it. What's the tiger after? Pleasure. He's after pleasure, but also, I think, and what I was thinking in particular, is immediate stimuli uh, in the moment. Now, in a certain sense, if we say, why does the tiger go after the tigress? There's a certain sense in which the right answer to that is in order to reproduce. That's why tigers mate, right? And in a certain sense of why, that's why tigers desire tigresses. But it's not the tiger's reason for desiring the tiger rat. The tiger doesn't think, you know, I don't have that much time in the world, and I want to leave behind <laughs> something. I want a legacy, <laughs> you know. N nor does it think, ah, oh, the, the joy of raising a tiger and teaching it how to hunt. You know, it's unaware of what's going to happen, <laughs> however many months it is for tigers after the tiger. Likewise, the tiger doesn't know that gazelles have, you know, proteins that it needs, you know, if it eats them and it, how many calories it can get. The tiger doesn't even know that it can die. All it has is desires for these individual things, which, lucky for it, uh, thanks to evolution, right, it's not really luck, but, uh, but through nothing that it consciously did, uh, work out pretty well for it. It works out so that there's something other than the tiger's consciousness, which makes it such that the things that occur to the tiger's consciousness are good for the ti tiger, keep the tiger alive. We don't have that. And if you think of a little child, he doesn't have anything more than the tiger has. He has things that strike him as pleasant. 
they taste sweet when he tastes them. He can remember that the last time he tasted it, it was sweet. Uh, he gets hungry again, and he remembers that this thing mommy gave him made him not feel hungry anymore last time. And so on the basis of the kinds of processes that go on in the tiger, um, he can cry for a bottle and a few things like that take kind of rudimentary, small-scale, localized, I think you said immediate, a range of the moment, uh, actions. And he doesn't have anything in him that gets him beyond that. that. That is, he doesn't have anything in him that coordinates all those range of the moment actions into something that adds up to a pursuit of his life. Whereas the tiger does. The tiger doesn't consciously pursue its life as a, a mind, but as an organism, it does pursue its life uh, by, as a consciousness, pursuing these short-range goals, which are rigged to enter its life. In the human case, we've got to do that rigging. We've got to, int we've got to do that rigging. Now, how do we do it? Well, we integrate short-range values into larger and larger range types of values. And you can think about this um, in child development. Um, so the, the child first, uh, you know, the candy tastes sweet. And then he, so he cries or you know, he wants the milk or you know, some perceptual level thing. And he has to do something to get it. And so he cries for it. He tries to struggle to crawl across the floor to get it. Or he directs his, his action in the range of a moment. But it's more than a moment, because he can't just take the act and right away get it. It takes maybe a minute rather than a moment. And over the course of that minute, he directs himself towards and struggles towards, which does not happen automatically. The thing which he, in a tiger-like perceptual form, can hold in mind as something that will give him pleasure. And suppose there are several different things like this. Uh, and on his way to the one thing that he's selected, some other pleasant thing appears off to the left side. I have to decide, you know, do I go off for that one or do I stay for the first one? And when he's a little bit older, it's not just things that you can get over the course of the couple of minutes walk over to where the thing is, but rather the kinds of things that he wants and can pursue are things that require action on a number of occasions over time. And he has more than one of them. And he has the task of coordinating his action for several of these things so that they don't conflict with each other. He has to budget his time and his life on fairly small scale ways, you know, maybe over the course of an hour at first, and then over an afternoon, and then over a week. And in order to do this, he has a situation a problem, if you like, to borrow the terminology from Rourke's view of architecture, that he confronts, that he's confronted in, a problem that he, that confronts him over the course of the minute, later over the course of the hour, over the year, uh, which consists in certain basic facts about his nature. Different things will have different effects on him. The first effects he can notice are pleasure and pain directly, but later other more complicated effects that he'll notice. And he needs to come up, and there are a range of different things that have these effects on him, and a range of different abilities that he has, and different potentialities and possibilities of the things around him to be used in various ways. And he has this kind of situation where he doesn't have some determinate goal that he's trying to seek. Just like before Rourke comes up with the central idea for a house, Rourke doesn't have some determinate goal he's trying to seek in the house. But there is a situation composed of needs that he can identify in himself or wants on a, a lower, more localized scale that he can identify in himself or his clients. Some of those wants formed by previous processes. And the problem is constituted by those things and by the facts about the various potentials of the things in the environment, the causal facts about what can do what. And in that context, there's an act of consciousness, an act of mind, 
of projecting something to go for that's a solution to this problem. It's a way to proceed in this situation. It's not something that's picked as a means to any particular end you already have. Because you don't have any end on this scale. You have lots of little ends, like I like chocolate, I like this toy, I like that toy. I think of it as, let's switch to an adult example, but one that's still short range. Think of it as planning an evening. You have the idea of, you know, what shall I do this evening? You, you want to enjoy yourself for the evening. And it's not as though you have some goal, an enjoyable evening and you select a bunch of things as a means to that. What are means to enjoying an evening? Dinner, a movie, and these things are selected as means to that goal because the goal is itself sort of indeterminate and it doesn't give you guidance on which of these things to select. I mean, all you'd know is do fun things and not awful ones. You know, you shouldn't put yourself in prison for the evening. That would, I mean, that, that's not how one actually selects. What one rather has is, you know, I've got some time on my hands, and one has a constellation of things one likes and dislikes, and a constellation of knowledge about the relationships between those things. And then one thinks, you know, what shall I do this evening? And one gets different sorts of evening plans that come to mind, which have different identities to them. You know, dinner and a movie, to pick a, a, a kind of stereotyped evening plan. But, you know, maybe some more interesting one that you come up with. What is that plan that you come up with, which then becomes your value that you pursue for the evening, your central idea for how the evening will go, in accordance with which you select everything else? It's an integration of a lot of lower level values and preferences that you have. And so you come up with, you integrate these things into a plan for the evening, which is now a value in accordance with which you select uh, other things. So dinner and a movie is the plan, and therefore I shouldn't have cheesecake right now because though it tastes good, I won't be hungry for dinner and you know, so forth. Well, as you grow up, if you do it properly, you progressively, uh, whether or not you do it properly, as you grow up to maturity, you are faced progressively with situations where longer and longer range and wider and wider scope planning of this sort is required of you. As a kid, you don't have to do any of this because you can't do any of this as a little kid because you don't even, you're not even aware of the kinds of alternatives that you face in life. And you don't have to be because your parents make sure there's food for you and shelter and that you don't run in front of a bus or squander all the money you'll need for your education or so forth on, on peanuts. Um, but at some point you have to start directing your own life and it fades in by degrees. And what you do is progressively integrate to broader and broader plans broader and broader visions of what you're going to do. Uh, and what's the culmination of that? What's an integration across the whole breadth and the whole span of a human life? Breadth, I mean, every different type of activity in your life gets, gets brought into this coordination so that there's no time off from it, so to speak. And scope means it's not just a plan for today or this year. Uh, but um, a plan for your life. Well, that's a purpose. That's a central idea for a life. And it's to do that which is to value life. And we all do it as we grow up, all of us who are good people anyway, to more or less explicitly. Bad people, I think, don't do it at all. But you don't necessarily do it in the sense of saying, you know, I want to live. Um, but you do it in selecting things and putting them together into something that is your life and which you, uh, in making those choices and forming that integration, uh, endorse and choose for yourself. And in selecting all your actions in, according, in accordance with it, automatize that as a standard of value. And to do that is to choose life. I think that in the kind of broadest way is what choosing life consists in. And then in a more 
localized sense, in any given moment, you're faced with choices about what to do. And those choices involve fidelity to those values. Those choices involve putting forth the effort to go after that thing, that whole, that complex, which you've chosen, which you've created, you've projected, which is your life. Or defaulting on it when it gets too hard, when you're tired, when some uh, emotion arising out of a bad context pulls you away from it in one way or another. We'll think in a moment about what the things are that might pull you away. The choice to perform that direction, to be conscious of what the whole meaning of what you're doing is, how it fits into the whole life, of how you can direct yourself, to choose to think or to suspend your consciousness and proceed like the tiger, uh, except you can't proceed like the tiger. You can go on your range of the moment emotions, which is what the tiger does, but your range of your, the moment emotions will not cohere by themselves into a life for you. They only cohere into a life insofar as they're formed by, that is, in, insofar as a set of values that add up to a life, you know, uh, insofar as they're formed and constantly maintained by a process of thought and selection. Now, I'm not going to read it, but there is a, a quote, quote 47, on your notes, which I only discovered or rediscovered recently after having thought about this along the lines I've just been describing for some time, in which uh, Ayn Rand says more or less the kind of thing I'm saying now, although in less detail, talks about the stages in which a child develops. Um, but so I don't read that now because it'll distract us, but if you're thinking, well, this is supposed to be Ayn Rand's conception of valuing, not, not mine, you know, where is it in her? Uh, I think a lot of it is what I'm doing is elaboration of what's true of her heroes and how things I have to work on her ethics, but some of it is here in these journal notes, and a lot of it is in the description of the characters as children. Um, what ethics is then, and this will be my last positive point before I open it up for discussion, is ethics as a discipline gives one standards for doing this. Just like Rourke in designing a building, for each building projects a new central idea and selects everything in accordance with it. But nevertheless, there are general standards of architecture, architectural principles, that tell him, one, that he needs to do that when doing a building, and two, tells him a lot of the details about how that's to be done, how it is that one subordinates details to the central idea, what the main means are to various sorts of ends. You know, for example, the central idea might involve there being a roof of a certain type that's cantilevered out, and his architectural principles tell him such things as, you can cantilever, and here's how to do it, and you can't cantilever when there's not something heavy to put on top of it, and, you know, whatever, I don't, I'm not an architect. Well, likewise, uh, moral principles do that for your life. They tell you that you need to be purposeful and rational in the way you live, that you can't just drift through life uh, if you want to live, but that the means to live, the way life is to be loved, is by finding a single central productive purpose, choosing one, endorsing it, setting all the details of your life around it, um, you know, being like John Galt. And they tell you a lot of the details of that, a lot of the, not the details, but the essential means to that. Uh, rationality is required to do that, integrity is required to do that. Uh, you can't be dishonest if you want to do that, and it's just not going to work, just like you can't cantilever a roof out if you've got nothing to hold it up. So morality in this analogy is the architectural standard. And what you choose in choosing life is a life, a life that you choose, yours, with all its particular contours and details uh, you know, essential details, features that individuate the life you want from other lives. You choose, if you're Howard Rourke, life by choosing Howard Rourke architect.
and you by choosing you, comma, whatever you are. Or whatever what you are is the, is the process of striving to be. Not to be, not to be something in particular like with Jim Taggart, but the opposite of what Jim Taggart does. Uh, striving to be something particular, striving for certain values. Now we're almost at the end, so I'm going to open it up to questions. I would think a very good question that should be asked is, well, what then does motivate the evil people? How does it work? But there might be other things that are more important to people, uh, and I suspect there are, so we'll see what people want. Uh, Keith, you had your hand up for quite a lot of time. Okay. Um, go ahead. I, I had a question about the first quote that you started the course with um, from capitalism uh -huh. uh, in relation to the, the IOS. Okay, that's the, the trichotomy between intrinsic, subjective, and objective views of the good. Mm -hmm. it, it seems easy to fall into a kind of leapfrog between the intrinsic and the subjective as a, as a substitute for the objective. And, and what, I, what I mean by that is that um, if first you take as your choice to live, and you take that as, that's not subjective, but it's the choice. Mm -hmm. to live. And then, uh, and, and then that requires certain things of you, and it, and you, that's not intrinsic either. You uh -huh. kind of think of it as life handing you these are these are the you know minimum for nutrition that you need uh -huh. or so on. Um, you have to eat and sleep, um, and then you choose something beyond that. I want to run marathons, mm -hmm. and then life hands you back or the reality so the, the information that you find out as to how I should eat or sleep. Uh -huh. Run the marathon, um, and it seems like there's a seri serious error in, in thinking of it that way. As I choose something, and then there's some requirements that I see. Have to so the idea would be. And I'm having trouble grasping that. All right. So what, one view would be you kind of choose something ex nihilo. You know, I want to be a marine biologist. You know, come out of nothing, uh, and then you know. I do that kind of all away from reality and up in myself. And then I look out at the world, all right, what do I need to be a marine biologist? Well, you need to know something about fish. You know. And then I say, OK, OK, I'll go learn something about fish. Uh, you know, so, so that the parts that come from you, your, 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 the parts that are chosen, occur in sort of isolation. Then you go back to reality. And I think it, you're right that that's not right. Um, what? actually happens. Well, you formulate values in a circumstance and on a basis. Now, that basis is going to be already formed values uh, of some sort, unless you're like an infant. And if you're an infant, it's going to be pleasure pain. Um, that is, an infant forms its first values by, you know, mmm, ugh. Uh, and it, it wants the mm things and not the things. But an adult doesn't form its values like that. But importantly, what's happening even for the child when it forms those values is it's not really the case that pleasure and pain is the standard of values. And that's one problem with this quote from the journals 47. Uh, she treats it there like pleasure and pain are the standard. And she seems a little uncomfortable about that. And in later notes, she, you start to see a trend of differentiating her view from hedonism, because she wants to show how that's not the case. So that's why I don't think that quote is, is quite her mature view, but it shows this orientation in it. You don't choose at random, so to speak, with no input from reality when you're making the choice. You have input in the form of your previous values or your automatic sensory pleasure pain responses. But the form in which those inputs take to the process isn't serving the role as a standard. You say, you know, what will cause the most pleasure or something. Rather, they play a different kind of role, the role of setting a context or situation. Now, I don't, I mean, this is something that's, I've been thinking about and don't quite have the perfect way to formulate yet. Um, but I can kind of direct you towards it and, um, you know, maybe you'll come up with a better way to formulate it than I can, either now or later. But um, think of it now 
by going back to the issue of do you choose life? Um, and the question of is the choice to live at all rather than not arbitrary? Or do you have a reason for it? Well, in a way you do have a reason for it. And in another way you don't. You don't have a reason in the sense of some higher standard than life in accordance with which you say, yeah, life is better than death. Existence is better than non-existence. But in another respect, you do have a reason for it. As, as Dr. Peikoff doesn't quite say it, I forget his exact phrasing, but his treatment of this is, I think, very insightful, uh, and as is so often the case. Um, your reason is all of reality. Because what you're choosing when you choose to live is everything versus nothing. You, what you're choosing is all of the particular values you have up till now that you've formed. Yes, I want those, and I want them together, and I want the whole world that those things constitute. And those things are, in a way, not just the particular ones you've formed already, but now the whole sum of the universe, which you're embracing in integrating it into the concept of existence, which is what I'm choosing, rather than just you know, a glass of water that I'm choosing. Um, in a way, those things are the reasons. Those, the, th that whole is the motivation for the choice. Um, but it's not the motivation or purpose in the way that a standard is. So that the standard either dictates it or you look to the standard to choose it. Rather, what you're doing is you're formulating a standard uh, out of materials. So the process of coming to value existence or coming to value is a process of integration. It's the equivalent in the action directing realm of induction as opposed to deduction. The kind of what's involved in saying I want this, I want X, Y is a means to X so I'll go after Y is essentially a deduction. It's what Aristotle calls a practical syllogism, right? You know, X is to be had, Y is a means to X, so Y is to be had. And then you go do Y. Um, but reasoning isn't uh, exhausted by deduction. And deduction is not the most interesting or important part of reasoning. Um, deduction is just, you know, using your induced generalizations. And the real problem of uh, in epistemology, not the problem, but the real thing that we need to understand is how one integrates, how one forms concepts and induces, the application of which is then deductive knowledge. Likewise, in ethics, you form values. The application of which, in, in the pursuit of them, is, you know, doing some particular thing because it's a means to some other thing which you value. Um, and like there is, a, you have to think about induction differently and, and in what way it's based on the things on which it's based differently uh, than you think about deduction. The way in which an induction follows from its instances is different from the way in which a deduction follows from its premises. So in the forming of a value and in the, the forming of the ultimate value, life, uh, is in a way based on the many concrete values and in particular and ultimately on the pleasure pain mechanism, but not in the way in which other values are based on it, uh, that is the value of life. Now exactly what is that way? Well, I think I've, I've said as much as I can right now to characterize it, and I've pointed to the kind of passages in Atlas Shrugged and the other, sorry, not in Atlas Shrugged so much, but in Ayn Rand's fiction, where you see her characterizing it and her sense of it. And it's now 10.02. So that will have to suffice for this year.